In the early 1950s in central Denmark, a series of mutilated corpses were found in a peat bog much like this one. At first, police theorized they were victims of ritual murder. The police were right, but they were also wrong. You will learn the amazing truth behind these hideous crimes as we journey into the world of the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected. Witness the death rites of a Balinese prince in a fiery ceremony designed to release his soul for reincarnation. Follow the bizarre travels of composer Franz Joseph Haydn's severed head. Discover a dream house that sticks out its tongue at convention and the peeling wall that seems to defy gravity. Observe the unusual rituals of grief practiced in New Guinea. Probe the bizarre mysteries of nature as time slows down. Explore the baffling mystery of the world's most famous violin, the Stradivarius. Join us in a festival where the spirits of the dead are welcomed back in one of the most macabre homecomings on record. And watch as a Texas oil heiress buried in her expensive automobile tries to prove you can take it with you. The strange, the bizarre, the unexpected. We'll examine those subjects a man named Robert L. Ripley dared us to believe it or not. For centuries, the remote marshlands of Denmark have provided a rich harvest of inexpensive peat fuel. In this dramatic recreation, the fields yielded another unexpected harvest. Stunned workmen were convinced they had uncovered a grisly murder. When police arrived, they noted the similarity to other murders in the region, a suspicion that is verified by pathologists in nearby Copenhagen. Cause of death, strangulation. The examiners also reach another startling conclusion. The victim has been dead for nearly 2,000 years. That 1950 disinterment was not the first such ancient corpse discovered. Hundreds of bodies like this have turned up in bogs all over Scandinavia. This is the Gravelé man. The lack of oxygen in the dense vegetation kept him from decomposing. His skin preserved by tannic acid in the bogs where he may once have walked and where his throat was cut from ear to ear. Why was he and the others like him murdered? The answer may lie here in these engravings of an early ritual. Anthropologists theorize that human sacrifice to ancient gods was the price paid for good fortune, for the tribe, not for the victim. Represented graphically on a silver cauldron recovered from another Danish bog, the blood ritual claimed victims that remained hidden for centuries. The bog people are finally at rest above ground in museums like this throughout Denmark. They died hideously, strangled, decapitated, their throats cut. Ironically, those who killed them have disappeared from the face of the earth while the remains of their victims are survived as mute testimony to the violence of those times. Like the Tolland man. The head is preserved here in the Silkeborg Museum in Denmark, just six miles from where the victim died 2,000 years ago. Believe it or not.
One of the tallest bell towers in northern Italy is located here in the Piazza del Comune in Cremona. It is a superb example of 11th century architecture. And up here, the Loggia del Militi. On the other side of the piazza, is very big in Cremona. You might say the violin is Cremona, or vice versa. The first of the great violin makers, Andrea Amati, was born here in 1535, and it was his grandson, Niccolo, who later took on a 12-year-old apprentice, Antonio Stradivari. He is buried here, and his secrets are buried with him. This is a Stradivarius. It's dated 1715. He must have been about 71 when he made it. It's sold new for $15. Today, it is estimated to be worth... Lot number 339, the Healy Stradivari. And a recent auction demonstrates the soaring value of an original Stradivarius. $10,000. At one hundred and ten thousand dollars, one hundred and twenty thousand. At one hundred and twenty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty with the order here, one hundred and fifty. At one hundred and fifty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy, one hundred and eighty. At one hundred and eighty thousand dollars now, at one hundred and eighty. At one hundred and eighty thousand dollars then, the bid is near me and against the room at one hundred and eighty thousand dollars in fair warning. One hundred and eighty thousand dollars. What is a violin? piece of wood, carved and shaped in a certain way, then it's varnished and uh, strings of gut are stretched across it. Almost any reasonably competent woodworker can make one. And, but then anyone can dog paint onto a canvas that doesn't make him a, a Rembrandt or a, a, a Renoir. For 150 years, the streets of Cremona were the home of such master violin makers as the Amati family, Carolo Bergonzi, Reggeri, Del Gesù, and Antonio Stradivari. The sound of the Stradivarius violin has never been duplicated or explained. He used a variety of simple tools to create an extraordinary instrument. He even left behind some of the templates he used to shape his violins. Yet careful analysis of his designs have yet to divulge the secret of Stradivari's achievement. Perhaps the secret is here, in the Lombardi wood he used. He selected spruce for the top, maple for the back. Each piece has its particular tone. But the Stradivari secret is not necessarily in the wood. The varnish he used has been analyzed. No special ingredients were found in it, or in the resin used to seal the wood. Varnish fragments have been subjected to the tools of modern technology, but infrared studies have failed to reveal the secret of the master's magic. Perhaps it will remain a secret forever. The Stradivarius magic is impenetrable to science, but it is obvious to the ear. Concertmaster James gets off.
one thing we do know, violin makers will never stop trying to duplicate the master. They've been trying for 250 years, and they haven't succeeded yet. The secret of the Stradivarius lies buried with the old man here in Cremona. Exactly what he did, how he did it, we'll probably never know. This is no Stradivarius. But then, I'm no Yasha Heifetz. Believe it or not. London's Royal Albert Hall attracts music lovers from around the globe. Today, believe it or not, they have come to hear the world's worst orchestra. The members of the orchestra are not professional musicians. All are amateurs, and most are unfamiliar with the pieces they're about to play. John Farley, the young maestro, has conducted the orchestra since it was founded in 1970. He is a carpenter by trade and can't read a note of music. Many of the performers share Farley's blatant lack of musical talent. That does not deter them, however, from attacking Thus Spake Zarathustra, the famous composition by Richard Strauss. Tchaikovsky is next. The soloist is Miss Sally Binding, the pieces the Tchaikovsky concerto in B flat minor, and more or less. Tchaikovsky survives the performance and provides the finale with his rousing 1812 overture. With the brass playing at least two bars behind everybody else, the orchestra presses toward a triumphant conclusion. For John Farley and his fellow uh, musicians, the performance is over, but not their symphonic career. They plan to return next year to play again, believe it or not. This 18th century church in Eisenstadt, Austria, is the final resting place of the great composer, Franz Joseph Haydn. That's from the seven words of the Savior by Haydn. 
love me, isn't it? The dignified world of classical music occasionally strikes a bizarre note. The history of Haydn's skull is one. Franz Joseph Haydn, the great Austrian composer, died in 1809. Shortly after the burial services, a man named Johann Peter, under cover of night, had Haydn's coffin dug up and his body exhumed. Peter was an amateur phrenologist, an occult science of the day that claimed that you could determine a person's intelligence by studying the bumps on the skull. Infatuated with Haydn's genius, Peter cut the head from the corpse and took it home. There, he very carefully peeled the flesh from the head, glazed the skull, and then put the grisly relic away for safekeeping. Haydn's head somehow passed into the custody of a certain Herr Rosenbaum, whose wife proudly displayed it in a glass case during her famed music recitals. It might have remained with the Rosenbaums had it not been the decision of Prince Esterhazy, a great admirer of Haydn's, to have the composer exhumed and reburied on his estate near Vienna. The headless body of Haydn was discovered, and an outraged Esterhazy, tracing the theft of the Rosenbaums, demanded that they return the head immediately. But to no avail, while the police ransacked the house searching for it, Frau Rosenbaum hid under the bed with his skull. Finally, the desperate Rosenbaum cleverly passed off a bogus skull on Esterhazy, which, with great ceremony, was buried with Haydn's body. Rosenbaum died, and in his will, gave back the original skull to Johann Peter, who had first stolen it. From Johann Peter, it passed through a number of hands in the 19th century, eventually ending up at the Society of the Friends of Music in Vienna, where it was augustly displayed in a special cabinet. There it remained until 1954, when the Viennese public insisting that a great national treasure had suffered enough abuse put pressure on the authorities to have poor Hyde buried intact. Though his body was in the Soviet zone and his head in the international zone, the occupying powers gave in to popular demand. In the summer of 1954, here in Eisenstadt, in the third funeral service after his death, Franz Joseph Haydn and his head were finally and forever reunited. Believe it or not. A tiny violin that actually plays fits inside a walnut shell made by Fred Bowerman of Friendsville, Tennessee. Believe it or not. Astounding creations of avant-garde architecture and the fantasy house of an artist's dream. See them next on Ripley's Believe It or Not. Sheer Energy Patty Hose. What are you going to do with all the extra energy you'll feel? Make the champ earn his title. Take another spin around the block. Discover life after five. So great looking, you'll want to go out in the town. So great feeling, your legs will feel more energetic to go harder, go longer. Sheer Energy Patty Hose from Legs in new control top, too. What are you going to do with the extra energy you feel? Freddy, stop fiddling. I'm not. I'm scratching. My shirt's not soft like before. And where's that fresh smell? Well, I just washed it. You didn't use Downy. There's a big difference without the softener. Only Downy combines skin-loving softness with April freshness. Makes static cling almost disappear. Tonight's the night. Mom, it's softer. And it smells good. They sure notice when you use Downy. And I notice the smile. 
April Fresh Downy. Hey, America, how many chews in a Charleston chew? Why? I've been getting 95 highway, 90 city. Mm -hmm. 109 is frequently my frequency. Rich, thick nougat and a delicious chocolatey coating make Charleston chew chewy, but not too chewy. How many chews do you get? 187. 98.6 is normal for me. America counts on Charleston chew. 367! Monday, meet the man who built his own fantasy island. Try a head spin with the wing walker and the hitchhiker who can hit up to 70 miles on his own set of wheels. That's incredible. Then, kiss the pretty rich girls. Make them sigh. Hunt them down. <gasps> and say goodbye. Someone's teaching them deadly lessons. Tomorrow. Planted in a Belgian garden by an American artist, these whimsical creatures are not entirely what they seem to be. These are the playful sculptures of artist Nikki de saint Paul. Hi, I'm Catherine Scherer, and we are, all of us, here in Kanoki, in Belgium. In this, the garden of artist collector Roger Nellen. Nikki de saint Paul calls my friends here the guardians because they guard a very special dragon, one that grew into a rather large beast. By enlarging her fanciful sculpture, artist Nikki de saint Fal has made a basic comment on conservative architecture. A home does not have to look like a traditional house, and many architects agree with her. This house of the Red Tongue was built for the children of its owner. The children have grown up and moved out now, but anyone is welcome. The house was intended to have no straight lines, only to be curved and soft and comforting. It's a place for play and imagination and dreams. A dream house with a long tail to explore. When we talk about our dream house, we don't usually mean something as bizarre as the dragon. But a passion for individuality created this house. And that kind of passion has inspired many others. The trees and the waterfall are inside this building in Hialeah, Florida. In Miami, the doors to get inside are outside. You can walk through or drive through. In Houston, passers-by may think this building is crumbling into ruin. It isn't. In New York, on this street in the Soho district, there's nothing unusual at all, except for these four people. They're the principals in a most unusual architectural firm called Sight. Their spokesman is James Wines. Well, Sight started in 1969 as a kind of protest, really, against bland and indifferent public structures. The fundamental difference, I think, in what Site is trying to do and what most architects seem to be about is that our buildings are really not about form, space, structure. They're really about ideas or what it makes you think about. In that sense, it's like a film or a play. When you go to see an evening of theater, you take away nothing except an ambience or something that it creates in your mind, a picture in your mind. The first project that we did was the Peeling Building, which is really a renovation of an existing shopping center. And what we did was we really just simply took the front of the building and took the actual brick and peeled it off into space. This, of course, evoked quite a reaction because it inverted the meaning of the building. The building was no longer just a box. It was a box to which some phenomena was occurring. One evening, a man from out of state came in in his car and pulled up in the front driveway and hopped out and ran up and beat on the door. And in all sincerity, he felt that the front was coming off this building. The ghost parking lot is in Hampton, Connecticut. The problem was really a troubleshooting situation. 
was a section of the parking lot that no one occupied because it was too far from the shopping center. What do you do with 250 feet of asphalt? So we just inverted that idea and putting the cars under the paving. We took actual automobiles, buried them partially under the paving, and then just asphalted right over, just rolled the parking lot right over them. Some of them like us, some of them don't. The older people don't. They think it's very morbid. But the younger generation, they, they think it's, it's great. The project has since become very much part of that community. In fact, now the community even wants to put a road sign on the main throughway to indicate that this is the home of the ghost parking lot. This tilted surprise was unveiled in Towson, Maryland in 1978, creating extraordinary interest in the otherwise ordinary is one of the guiding principles of site architecture. This, I think, will take a little getting used to. Stuart, beautiful store, but the out, I don't like the way that concrete, the way it's on the outside. It gives off an unfinished look, but it's really nice. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's always been our idea to create simple images, very, very simple reductive images, which are evocative, or they make you think about something. The grand opening of this site-designed building in Sacramento, California, was just that, but in a startling new way. Resembling a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, the corner is both a freeform sculpture and a surprising new way to get in and get out. Well, I, I couldn't believe it. I just thought that maybe something had gone wrong with the architecture. <laughs> I think it's really neat. I was really surprised the first time I got here and I looked over and the thing was out and I looked back over again, it was pushed in again. People like the cultural advantages of living in a city, but on all the other hand, they like gardening and, and the advantages of living in the country. So we thought we could kind of bring these two worlds together in the high-rise of homes, which is nothing but a big steel matrix, very much in the standard high-rise type, except that instead of closing the walls in, we leave it open, fill the landings, the various platforms, with dirt, so you literally buy a plot of land in the sky, and then you can build a suit. So this is the best of all possible worlds. If you can be in the city and at the same time have tend the garden and have your own image in terms of a private home. Your own cabin in the sky, believe it or not. A house divided. A home built in Germany by two brothers who could not agree on its design. Believe it or not. A celebration of the Day of the Dead. The cremation of a prince. And a woman who elected to be buried in her sports car. Next on Ripley's Believe It or Not. See, I'll work on the average of an 11 hour day, and when I'm beginning to get hungry, I'm not thinking about my work, I'm thinking about my next meal. It's so satisfying! Snickers is packed with peanuts. I'll have one at two or three in the afternoon when I'm hungry, and uh, come dinner time, I'm fine. Peanuts and peanut butter nougat, caramel and milk chocolate blended together. Satisfying! Packed with peanuts, Snickers really satisfies. I'm not hungry. I know I'm going to be okay till dinner time. Dry cat food gets its taste from real chicken protein, real milk protein, and real tuna protein. Not flavors, but the real protein rich foods cats crave. My kitty cat craves, crave. Protein rich foods cats crave. Tuesday. Like, it's just a bowl of cherry. Bonzi has wedding plans. What? He's getting 
Mary. Happy days. Then Squiggy puts the squeeze on Carrie Fisher. You're from out of town? No, I'm a Sally boy. Laverne and Shirley. Tuesday. Ripley's Believe It or Not will continue in a moment. Tuesday, Jack objects to another roommate. Shut up, Jack! Ripley's company. And secret plans get Violet in trouble. Right up to your second chin. Nine to five. Then a poison cigar and Max is the mark. Is Max dead? Heart to hearts. Tuesday. The exciting Cole Porter Review, Some Like It Cole, will be at E.J. Thomas Hall Friday, March 11th, followed by the Vienna Choir Boys March 16th. Call 375-7570. On Ryan's home. Why couldn't she have told me my father was rich and successful and important? For 22 years, her life was a lie, and she searched for the father she never knew until a secret letter reveals her hidden past. Tell no one anything for now. Get it, Daddy. Ryan's hope. WAKR TV 23, Akron, Canton. few things in life that interest us as much as death. After all, we're all heading in that direction. That's why we have this fascination with the rites and rituals that follow in death's wake. Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris is the very fashionable resting place of the famous and the not so famous because of one unusual entrepreneur. This was all the dream of a Monsieur Nicolas Frochot who bought the land to start the cemetery 175 years ago. He had great plans for it. It was to be the inn place to be buried. But he had forgotten one important point. An inn place only assumed that status when inn people use it. And since he had no inn people to start off with, dead or alive, business was very slow. And then he heard that some workmen had discovered the long-lost casket containing the remains of Queen Louise de Lorraine. He quickly arranged to have it transferred to his new cemetery and business began to pick up. It became fashionable to lie beside a queen, even one as unimportant as Louise de Lorraine. Soon, new clients were dying to get in. The list is endless. The famous and the infamous, the in and the not so in. All lie here, somewhere in this 280 acres. Pianist and composer Frederick Chopin rests comfortably near the unusual memorial to a man who was eaten by a lion. The crypt of controversial dancer Isadora Duncan pales beside the inventive mementos of lesser known figures. Music hall singer Edith Piaf, French novelists Honoré de Balzac and Marcel Proust share equal billing with the divine Sarah, actress Sarah Bernhardt, and English writer Oscar Wilde remains in self-imposed exile. The simplest, yet perhaps the most bizarre of the tombs is that of rock musician Jim Morrison, defaced by the graffiti of his fans. As for the enterprising Monsieur Frochot, as an indication of how successful this whole thing turned out, he was able to sell a single plot to the man from whom he had originally bought the land for 272 times what he had paid for the entire cemetery. Death is a thriving business, believe it or not. The journey into the netherworld, a macabre cruise down a gentle stream, can be a solemn occasion. These ghostly figures in a mockery of death are participants in a bizarre ceremony called El Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead.
celebrated throughout Mexico in observance of All Souls and All Saints Day, the occasion combines ancient Indian tradition and contemporary religious ritual. Once a year, the dead are invited to return for a brief visit with friends and relatives. It is that belief that motivates a carnival atmosphere, an attempt not to frighten the spirits away, but to make them welcome. Despite the gruesome costumes, the mood is perhaps more appropriate for a county fair than for a coming home party at a cemetery. Believe it or not. In New Guinea, the universal pain of loss is shared by an entire tribe. A young girl has died. Her father voices a ritual chant while relatives bring gifts to honor her passage. To honor the death of the chief, however, a more elaborate ritual is enacted. Covered in gray river clay, the chieftain's wife and other female relatives display their grief by wearing beads made from the seeds of a plant known as Job's Tears. Tribal law requires the widow to wear the beads during the entire period of mourning, a time that will not end until they have all been removed, one string per day for about two years. A ritual burden the beads are to be worn for all ceremonial occasions. In daily life, however, she is free to wear only a token few. The weight of the symbols of her sorrow are almost 50 pounds. Believe it or not. The raising of a tower signals an event of curious joy, the death of a prince. A symbolic conveyance, the tower is used to transport the body of the prince to the site selected for the royal cremation. By cutting away the shroud covering the prince's body, Priests provide clear passage for the soul's flight into the world beyond. To further assist the prince on his journey, the faithful gather to provide a final service. It begins at the sound of the kulku drum. Marcus parade with the symbolic dragon is believed to protect the passage of the prince by confusing evil spirits seeking to invade his body. A ceremonial bull will be the prince's funeral pyre. At its final destination, the tower will be unburdened and the body transferred to the bull. It will be the last time the people will see their prince. Despite rough handling of the corpse, no disrespect is intended. For the Balinese, the ceremony glorifies the spirit, not the flesh. 
Prince's subjects pay homage with offerings of expensive fabrics and other gifts. Smaller bulls are filled with the remains of their relatives. For the Balinese, the occasion is a rare opportunity to honor their deceased kin by cremating them in the company of royalty. flames the spirit soar now free the Balinese believe to be reincarnated again from these ashes the spirits will return as people or as a new form of life The life expectancy of an expensive sports car depends on who drives it. A 1964 Ferrari is encased in this box. Inside the car is the body of Texas oil heiress, Sandra Eline West. Wealthy, eccentric, and determined, her final exit was of her own design. Her will specified all the details of her burial and her attorney was there to answer any questions. In other words, you have verified that the body is indeed yes, in the car, and the car correct. is in the box. That is correct. And the box is sealed. That is correct. Inside the car, inside the box, Miss West is wearing her best lace nightgown. For some spectators, a philosophical comment is irresistible. Well, I, I think they said we came here with nothing, and we were going to leave with nothing, but she's going to leave with hers. Got to take it with her. Taking it with her. Sealed under concrete in the car she adored, Sandra West illustrates that the rights of death are an individual affair. Believe it or not. A poet's tomb in a living tree. Hans von Tumult was buried inside a tree, and it grew to totally enclose his body. Believe it or not. Probe the bizarre mysteries of nature as time slows down. Next on Ripley's Believe It or Not. Joe Brown's gone fishing. So has Sally Gray. They're out to catch that light and tasty flaky hot filet gone fishing. McDonald's and you. Filet of fish is hot and tender, tangy sauce and melted cheese. Wouldn't you like to go fishing now? Catch one of these. Filet of fish. McDonald's and you. From out of the distance comes a driver's car. Pontiac 2000 for 1983. A car that takes on the road with a smooth, shifting, five-speed transmission with overdrive. The ready response of electronic fuel injection. And the steady, willing power of an overhead cam four-cylinder engine. Pontiac 2000. Pure driving pleasure. At Pontiac, we build excitement. They took high C and they put it in a box. They put it in a Drink box. The high sea drink box. Take the straw off the rear. And you put it in here. They call it the box. Drink box. The high sea drink box. Introducing high sea fruit drinks in the new drink box. With the delicious fruit taste of high sea and a full day supply of vitamin C. Just call it the box. Drink box. The high sea drink box. Wednesday. The high performance team joins a Central American revolution. Now, this is my kind of scene. High performance. Then, in action, Colt turns cop to run down a coke ring. Hooray for me. The fall guy. Then, Steven! It's the day for a homecoming. My son. And for a deal. Your baby for bucks. But the night's for a wedding. Dynasty. Wednesday. 
Thursday, baby's got the flu. Oh, well, they got them all bundled up like a little burrito. And four babysitters, too many. You want Grandpa Jesse to sing your song? God, no. Then, is it something in the air or something in the food? I love you. When the love bug strikes Amanda's. It's an epidemic. Did you know a wet dog twists its body in two ways at once? Its splatter becomes a thundering rainstorm for nearby plants and insects. We see it all because the camera can capture what we otherwise could not see. This hallway connects the studios and offices of a little known place called the Stroboscopic Light Laboratories. The people who work here call it Strobe Alley. I'm about to be subjected to an interesting experiment. That's why I'm wearing black. I'm about to prove conclusively that the hand, as well as just about everything else, is quicker than the eye. The truth is, we rarely see what's going on before our eyes. Some things move too slowly, or they're too small, or too large, or happen too quickly. In a nutshell, that's why Dr. Harold Edgerton developed the stroboscope, a photographic technique that permits him and us to see things we could never see before. This is Dr. Edgerton's studio at MIT. Hello, Hello. Dr. Edgerton. Good morning. We'd like to have you skip rope for us. All right. Climb up on the platform there and aim north. Which way is north? That way. Okay. Colorado. Okay. It's perfect. Hold it now. Let's get some film in there. Called Papa Flash, Edgerton began his pioneering experiments in stroboscopic photography over 50 years ago. The technique relies on brief but incredibly bright flashes of pulsating light. And start going. I was a lot better at this one than the little girl. Out it comes. We got the rope, we got everything. Now how many would there be in there? Well, it's it's so running it's running hundred and twenty a second and what oh, it got a quarter of a second? Quarter of a second. So we should have 30 pictures in there. The same stroboscopic technique captured the detailed grandeur of this moment. It can also stop time at the instant a bullet passes through an apple. During World War II, Dr. Edgerton used a similar method to reveal German troop movements in the dark of night. Introducing Dr. Harold E. Edgerton of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The stroboscope stroboscopic photography was in its infancy in 1940, when this Academy Award-winning short film was made. It's narrated by Pete Smith. Through this invention, you can examine machinery in motion. Here, a common electric fan is used in a simple demonstration that even I can understand. In case you're still skeptical, we'll drop an egg. Fresh, I hope. Yes? No. That egg smashed in the blink of an eye, but let's drop another and see what really happened. It bounces from blade to blade before it breaks. Interesting. Using smoke to point up the action, our prof shows us what these fan blades actually do to the air. Chopping the ozone, the narrow blades send off small whirlpools of air which quickly break up. I always thought that my cat, in lapping her milk, curled her tongue up. But now it's revealed that she curls her tongue down. See? In other words, she brings the milk up on the underside of her tongue. Now see how smart you get when you go to the movie? In conclusion, we go to the dentist for our final super speed pictures. Most of you have heard, and perhaps have even felt, that cute little drill. Oh, but have you ever seen it in use? In ultra slow motion? No? Well... Ooh. 
Wow, there it goes. Gosh, what's he drilling for? Oil? Forty years later, Harold Edgerton is still exploring the unseen world. Before me, there are two streams of water forced by an intermittent pump at 60 times per second. The stream looks continuous to my eye. If I turn on the strobe light, it's obvious that the stream consists of individual drops. And these drops are now coming out at about 60 times per second. And the strobe is operating at almost 60 times per second. So there's a slight motion showing how the drops are formed and how they impact. When we look, we think we see one drop. Actually, we are looking at a sequence of drops because the light flashes for about two millionths of a second as each drop passes that particular place. Where Edgerton has led, others have followed in the pursuit of ultra slow motion photography. to see with the unaided eye, nature's secrets are revealed under the lenses of high-speed cameras. Until now, such miraculous moments as this went unseen. Raindrops trigger the release of millions of spores in the propagation of mushrooms. In another context entirely, Shakespeare had Macbeth say, out, out, brief candle. But how long is brief? And what exactly is out? Watch. Time loses its meaning as an instant becomes an eternity. Believe it or not. More of Ripley's Believe It or Not in a moment. Here you go, Leo, a nice bowl of Campbell's soup. Oh, thanks, Claire. You know, I missed you last week. Yeah, well, I've been putting in a little overtime. At least you're taking care of yourself. Huh? Soup, Leo. This article in Reader's Digest says that soup's one of the most nourishing foods you can eat. Why, this Campbell's chicken noodle is just right for a big strapping guy like yourself. You know, Claire, it's nice to know that someone's looking out for me. You noticed. Campbell's soup is good food. Mike Dale thinks he's about to eat the same candy bar he always eats. Mike, try a Twix candy bar instead. Why, I'm happy with my favorite. Ah, but does your favorite candy bar have a mix? A what? A mix. Rich milk chocolate. I love chocolate. Creamy caramel. Chocolate and caramel? They're great together. And a cookie crunch. Crunch? Right, that's the mix. Mmm, Twix is delicious. Twix cookie bars, the chocolate candy with the cookie crunch. Delicious. My mascara has to lengthen and thicken, separate and define, and make my eyes leap off the page. It has to last without smudging. It has to have a fiber-free formula with a brush that's curved to color every lash. It has to make my eyes look big and beautiful. CoverGirl's demanded it. All you do is ask for it. CoverGirl Professional Mascara. Kraft brings you a dressing idea so delicious it sizzles. A taste so fresh it's juicy. Bacon and tomato dressing. It just had to be Kraft. With real bacon, crisp and lean, real tomato chopped in bits, and a touch of sour cream. If you think it sounds good, 
Just wait till you taste it. Kraft Bacon and Tomato Dressing. For a better twist on taste, America turns to Kraft. Next Sunday, get ready to go on a fascinating journey as Search shows the perfect killing machine in action. This is the suit that I was wearing when I got bit. Search uncovers the mystery of premenstrual syndrome. The doctor's diagnosis was that I was schizophrenic. Search is there when a man has a heart attack and survives. Search reveals the secrets of Gaylord Berry's spitball. I'm going to try to ignore it until I get to the point where I can't stand it anymore, which happens about every four and a half seconds. Don't miss this fascinating special next Sunday, Search. Believe it or not, for generations that phrase has summoned up memories of the marvelous tales of the fantastic. Believe it or not will forever be associated with the man who popularized it, Robert L. Ripley. The Ripley Memorial Museum here in Santa Rosa, California, Ripley's birthplace, is a one of a kind, like the man it celebrates. Originally a church, it was built in 1873 from a single redwood tree that yielded more than 78,000 board feet of lumber. Inside are the remembrances of a man as unusual as any of the oddities he presented to an eager public. Ripley was an avid collector of the bizarre, and the museum contains a number of offbeat items the man picked up in far off places. For inspiration, Ripley drew on his experience as an intrepid explorer and reporter of the exotic. He was fascinated by human nature, its foibles, its rituals, and in his travels, he saw enough of both to last ten lifetimes. Confidant to movie stars, athletes, and kings. Visiting more countries than any man in history, Robert Ripley preferred to live alone. By the time of his death, May 27th, 1949, Believe It or Not was read by 80 million people daily in 38 nations in 17 different languages. Believe it or not. This is David Hartman. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, a report on the debut of the U.S. Football League, coverage of the Pope in Central America. Later this week, Grammy winner Melissa Manchester, plus all the news on Good Morning America.